wedding I've ever been to, the bride looks like a trash pile at the end of the night. <laughs> Literally, her dress is just black at the bottom and she's trailing garbage. We have Natasha, who is a comedian, extremely funny. If you want to go check her out on YouTube and Instagram, a bunch of great stuff on there, but diving into what she does as well, as she branched out well past the stage into podcasts, a breakup gift registry, she does events, she does like memberships and paid groups and all these different things. Today we're going to dive into how she's turned that personal brand into a raging successful business, all the different products and services she's been able to create and all the amazing things she's done. So thank you so much for joining, Tasha. Thank you for having me. Wow, you make me sound cooler than I feel most days. <laughs> That's my job. I've got to hype people up. Yeah, you're a great host. Thank you for that wonderful intro. I mean, I'm a comedian, so people don't usually bring me on stage with that level of joy. Like, you've kind of beat me to the punch. Like, how do you usually introduce yourself? What do you kind of, when you're meeting someone at a bar or a party, or you've never met them, like, what do you say you kind of like do? Because you do so many different things, like after going through and researching and stalking you for for a little while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you do a lot. You know, I think maybe having lived in LA for 11 years, I was just I, self-trained and not really talk about what I do because everybody else talks about what they do first. So I let, them, <laughs> I let whoever else I'm talking to bring that subject up. And then if I decide to join in uh, with candor or if they ask me questions, I kind of just pick whatever makes sense for whatever they might be giving me first. Um, because otherwise it feels like a whole pitch in a story that nobody wanted. And, <laughs> and people can only digest so much. Like if they come to a comedy show, I'm not going to like force a bunch of other things on them unless it's like merch or something mm -hmm. that makes sense for that particular space. So I try to be kind of selective about who gets what information, and how much of it. <laughs> Nice. So humble. <laughs> yeah. Coming from LA, it's very, very tough to uh, get a word in. But Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> uh, you have, you do draw a lot of eyeballs with all the stuff you do in comedy and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, one of the other big things that you did was started a gift registry for breakups. Um, yeah. You know, I know, I know that sort of going through some of your content looks like it came out of a bad situation. But how do you even see that opportunity? <laughs> like, I know there's a lot of people listening who you know, might not have a search situation or they have, you know, a situation where they're still looking for opportunities. And the hard part is kind of like identifying it and jumping on it. So how did you sort of notice it? Yeah. I mean, that is, that is a question that I haven't really been asked before in this capacity. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, kind of like when I get into how I started in comedy, it's the same thing. Like there's all these kind of like pinpoints that lead you to a, a spot. Um, I didn't, know that I would start a company of this nature. Um, but I had a lot of interest in the startup world. So uh, probably about seven years ago, I, you know, was starting to tour as a comedian, not so much headlining yet, but featuring for a lot of other comics. And when you're a solo working female comedian and you're traveling as a feature, you're not staying at the best hotels. <laughs> you're staying at... <laughs> very mediocre, sometimes some somewhat scary places. And so I okay. didn't, I, I didn't like traveling, feeling like I was a broke, struggling artist. Like there, there was a way to kind mm -hmm. of start retraining the way that you look at yourself as an artist by starting to elevate how you operate. So I looked mm -hmm. into, you know, hotel partnerships and crafty ways to start working with hotels and building those relationships really helped me understand what businesses and what companies need. And it's not always a post with a tag because that doesn't really do a lot. You know, you need to kind of create mm -hmm. brand awareness for a company. So I started creating thoughtful partnerships using my podcast, you know, stories, things that felt very real and genuine because they were um, with specific hotels. And from that juncture, I was like, wow, there's a lot of opportunity to work with brands in a way that creates brand recognition and awareness without being in your face or doing like an ad partnership or something that feels sponsored. Mm. Um, so I started looking and setting Google alerts for certain technology brands, things that were launching. Um, so I would get Google alerts all the time for restaurant apps, hotels, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, select card, different things that were kind of elevated lifestyle, but still growing. And, um, mm. I partnered with a few apps to help them get into some hotels and restaurants that I had worked with in the event space for years in Los Angeles. Um, 
Mm. and started brokering deals. And that kind of culminated in 2019 when I did a um, cold call to a hotel in Las Vegas to create a weekly show that I flew in and out of Las Vegas for. So I got to bring in like a lot of brands and liquors and sponsors into that one place that we're looking for traction in Las Vegas. And so that's where I kind of started to really understand what the opportunity was in the space of working with growing companies and growing a company and how you build an audience in that way. Wow, that is wild. <laughs> that's a lot more than I thought. <laughs> I was going to go out of that. Um, wow, that's really impressive that you spotted that opportunity and kind of jumped on it. Um, and so in terms of when you were traveling around going to these different hotels and you were saying you were kind of doing co-branding stuff with your podcast or maybe your social media and that sort of thing. What's like an example? I know you gave the hotel where you would do events or gigs or a show at, but how did you, like, I, I take it you didn't do that for every hotel you stayed mm -mm, at. Not um, for every. What sort of other examples for maybe other travel influences or people who are on the road and kind of looking to, you know, stay in really nice places, but obviously don't want to pay the $1,000 a night yeah. fee that they're charging. <laughs> so if you over blanket yourself, you really water down your brand and you don't have much identity to stand on to be able to pitch yourself to other brands. So when I looked into a hotel mm -hmm. partnership, I looked at a trendy, uh, very me feeling hotel. And I started working with them. I First, I reached out on Instagram, which is the easiest in because that person that does the social media usually has the contact for the PR or the branding person or whatever. So I reached mm -hmm. out, um, said, you know, I'm interested in working with the company in this capacity. I tour a lot. I would love to connect on a call. So I set up a call and I basically laid out, this is all the stuff that I do. I'm going to send you a package. So I created a media kit that has like all my numbers, mm -hmm. but also different brands that I've worked with and how it feels very organic and sent mm -hmm. that to them. And that's when we created this kind of national partnership. So now whenever I go, they're like in every major city. So they're a Marriott extension. So when I go um, to those cities and I reach out to whoever might be the local mm -hmm. PR person, and I can I straight up call the hotel, like they have the location in South Beach. When I was going to South Beach for the first time, I just straight up called the hotel and I was mm -hmm. like, hey, can I speak to your PR person? And I explained that I'm a, like a partner of the hotel nationally. They connected me straight through to the person and I got, and now mm. I stay at that location <laughs> whenever I'm there. So, That's genius. Um, so it was, yeah. you know, and then I recorded my podcast on their property a number of times, but instead of making it like shout out to blah, 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 I would say I'm here at, mm. you know, and then name the hotel. So mm. it didn't feel more organic. Yeah. It didn't feel like an ad. It felt like, I'm creating this awareness that people expect to see me at this chain of hotels a lot. And, um, you know, it started as free stays, but then it turned out to become like these comedy pop-up events, also incorporating my company. And I've done them in New York and uh, Chicago and South Beach. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, I mean, they're always willing to kind of branch out with you once you prove that you can do something interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's such a good idea, partnering or like finding a brand that has like a lot of locations mm -hmm. because that's such an easy in yeah. anytime you go to that new location. It's like, yeah, I've already worked with you guys in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, we can do a similar thing for you in LA, New York, San Francisco, whatever it may be. Yeah. That's and genius. then those partnerships start to become monetizable because then you can add in your other skill sets or then you can say, okay, I, I've been doing this. Now I'd like to create content for you. And this would be content that I just give you in a folder and you just have it to use and it has nothing to do with me or my mm. socials or tagging because that sometimes is more valuable to a brand. Like not only do you get a free stay, they're going to pay you whatever they pay you, which is nominal, but they don't have to pay for this whole photo shoot and videographers to come mm -hmm. in if you're going to send them content like that. So you become a really valuable yeah. key player in their uh, portfolio of partners. Yeah, and there's a few few brands that we've worked with as well where we'll have content creators on payroll. So they'll mm -hmm. just get paid a monthly fee to deliver, it might be like 10 images and five videos, for example. Yep. Um, so I'm sure once you do that once, you can then roll it into a recurring thing as exactly. well. Exactly, exactly. Amazing. Okay, and then so getting to the other big thing, um, I know your breakup registry, <laughs> super interesting spin on a registry. <laughs> um, how did that? And obviously we know how that got started, but <laughs> um, kind of like, where did that 
kind of come from? Did you have any indicators to be like, hey, this is a great idea, people are loving this? Or like, how did you identify that that was something that could actually turn into a business? Well, you know, I hate to say it, but love to say it. I've been watching Shark Tank like since it came out. Um, so I <laughs> would be at LA Fitness just on the elliptical watching Shark Tank. That's what I would do at, when I was working out. And so I had found this company <laughs> called Honey. It's productive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, running and stuff like that. I do a lot of like podcasts and watching, you know, whatever. Um, mm. But I found the company Honey Fund forever ago. And I thought that they were just really cool. I've been following their track record. I liked that they were a female founder, Sarah Margulis, and mm. um, saw that Kevin O'Leary invested. So I'd been tracking their progress. And I always thought, what a cool spin on a wedding registry, like honeymoon funding. People get to be a part of this process. Like they get to gift you mm -hmm. something and see your pictures from that experience. Oh, that's so neat. And then when I went through my breakup, I actually had a honey fund registry, registry um, when me and my ex-fiance mm -hmm. split and uh, recreated it after our breakup to just be like my name, <laughs> like I'm marrying myself and send it to people just as a joke. And people were like, wow, that's, that's genius. Love that's this. really funny. <laughs> and then the pandemic hit. So I was like, I'm, I feel like I needed to build a startup at some point and this is the one. So I just went to town. Mm. Um, and then I actually like two months into the pandemic became an early investor in Honey Fund. Um, so they're, mm. they're not public yet, but I became an investor like at a good time. And so I feel like I have a really nice, like kind of like surface relationship with them. I, you know really believe in what they are building and I'm kind of building the ugly stepsister of that <laughs> but in a in a pretty way like the direction it's headed is really beautiful but um nice. yeah so and then I also because I love brands and different you know companies like it gives me the chance to create this spider web of partnerships on the back end where it becomes free to users mm -hmm. and I get to still elevate other brands which is something that I love to be able to do so yeah it's really cool and then I saw that you also did kind of like a TV series on like building a business. I think it was like called In the Box or something like that. Um, you know, was that was that valuable in growing it? Is is there any main takeaways you had from getting that mentorship or getting that help and to other people kind of in the stage before they turn, you know, an idea or an opportunity into a business? Do you think something like that helps? Um, it it. Everything that you choose to do, you just have to know that you're going to find a takeaway. So, I mean, I always find a takeaway because I'm looking for a takeaway. So does it make sense? Um, so yeah. I'm not looking to have a bad time or not find something out of something I participate in. So um, that was when I had started looking at accelerators. So this was called The Blocks mm -hmm. and it's Weston Bergman's series mm -hmm. slash mini accelerator. So it's like a week long, very intense entrepreneurship program that they actually document. And um, oh, it's only a week. It's a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're cramming a lot in a week. <laughs> a <then>. lot. <laughs> it was exhausting. Um, I actually won the most investable. I think the thing is behind me somewhere. <laughs> I did. There I did go. win the most investable. Um, nice. But uh, it was helpful in, I did meet a lot of uh, people that are like venture backers, you know, really smart entrepreneurs that were on the panel of judges. But I also, the most valuable thing, and same in stand up, is your peers. I got to meet a ton mm. of brilliant up and coming entrepreneurs. And I just had a call with one yesterday or the day before, but we all stay in touch. Like, you know, same with like we do with comedy. Like I like to see other people succeed. And when they're coming up with new ventures, we think of how we can collaborate. And mm. there is so much crossover between entertainment creator and technology. I mean, it's like basically a giant blend. So, um, mm. you know, getting to know what people are up to and being kind of in the, in the mix of these new, uh, these new platforms that are about to come out is, is really beneficial in my opinion. Um, so I found it to be a great, it was a really great series to be a part of. And it also helped me prep for when I started submitting to bigger accelerators for actual equity. Nice. And so if you were to go and do it all again, or give someone advice to maybe a content creator, who's got an idea and they're trying to sort of get started, would you say go down the accelerator path? Uh, are there any like 
cons that you found once you kind of got into it? Um, the, I mean, there's no there's no right way to do anything. Like that's the hard part. There's just not. It's a lot of trial and error. So I don't really want to give like yay or nay advice. But here's mm-hmm. here's what happened with me and my accelerator path. So some accelerators, similar to venture capital, want you to be further along and whatever that means and can be pretty gray. Um, Mm -hmm. I think as a creator first, it's really helpful to validate the idea. I did the scariest thing that you can do. And I started talking about my idea before it was even launched, like months before it was even launched. People are terrified that you had to do it. People are scared. (laughs) They're going to steal your shit. And everybody is, it's hard to build a business. They're not going to do it unless they're super driven and really driven people make their own shit. So they're not going to take your stuff, (laughs) you know, like, so I got over that really quickly because I was like, screw it. Like if somebody tries to take this, they're not going to have my story. They're not going to be me. Mm -hmm. They're not going to do it my way. And Mm -hmm. uh, so I built in public. So to me, the reason Mm -hmm. that was really valuable is because I have metrics from that. I have all of these screenshots from different messages from people that were already using the platform or that were excited about the platform and different offers for Mm -hmm. new podcasts that can build the brand and things like that already before I even started looking at accelerators. Um, So then when I started, that all can culminate into traction. Traction can mean a lot Mm -hmm. of different things. Um, So traction and some sort of clout as a creator online can give you multi it can launch you multiple steps ahead of just somebody who's like in Iowa coming up with an idea doesn't have a platform doesn't have you know doesn't know Mm. anybody yet like it can sidestep a couple a couple of things um so then when I went to my first accelerator it was one of the biggest accelerators in the world (laughs) top two uh (laughs) I'll just say that um, I was I placed 14th out of like 5,000 submissions. Nice. Um, so it got me into the door with all like the funds and people I want to have those real like money conversations with, which is great. Mm-hmm. Damn! Congrats, that's <laughs> awesome. What a what a sort of success story. I um, I actually went through that accelerator finals while I had a broken foot at the start of this year. So it's a pretty crazy time. <laughs> wow. So what is the time period of all this actually? I didn't kind of look back, but like what was the time period of like, you know, starting it, going um, doing all this TV shows, podcasts, everything, and then to now? Like what's been the lifespan of that? Yeah. So conceptualizing and building the LLC and starting to uh create the brand and logos and design and feel was all 2020. Um, 2021 Mm -hmm. later in the year was launch after my special had already come out. Then I converted to C Corp. So I wish I would have known that in Mm -hmm. advance, but if you're planning to get funding down the line, I mean, LLCs are much cheaper, but converting is really expensive. So (laughs) (laughs) so maybe look into s corp or c corp right out the gate um unless you don't you know unless you can build without um getting funding um so yeah and then early early 2020 all of 2022 i spent kind of building getting feedback getting traction doing like little updates um and then early 2023 was you know more advanced accelerator focused and now I'm fundraising. So nice. it takes a while. It takes all, a while. all those, all those billionaires listening to this podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Come at me, <laughs> man. Come at me. I'm tired of funding my yeah. own stuff. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and we do, we do it forever. You know, I've been in entertainment for 17 years and always funded my own pitch it, you know, concepts I was mm. pitching series that I was right I mean it's I've never come with my hand out so it's uh fun to finally do that yeah. with something to stand on yeah well at the I think that is one of the reasons why the entrepreneurship path or like starting businesses from you know having a big following or a big awareness bubble from something 
starting or getting to the business stage of actually making money is so hard because you've got to put in the time, you've got to put in the funds, mm -hmm. even just to get the ball rolling. It's Yeah, it's very um, expensive. Yeah, yeah. Not to put any of you guys off listening, but still, still have a go. <laughs> <laughs> You'll figure it out. Like if you want to make something happen bad enough, you just figure it out. You know, you can be really scrappy and, you mm. know, being a, being an entertainer for this long taught me to be scrappy. So, you know, mm. you figure, figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And next question is you've got so many balls in the air. How do you sort of divide up your time or how do you sort of be like, okay, this is the focus this month or today or quarter, however you break it up. Mm -hmm. Do you even think about that? Or Big do time. you split up your time? How do you, how do you manage that? Big time. So, um, I'm pretty good about time blocking, but here's the thing. I fully disagree with the over pushing and constant like thinking about what you're going to do next. Like as a creative, I've been, I fall into that trap a lot of times where I've like overdone it and I still do even trying to rein it back a, a bit. Um, so it is good to create kind of focused time blocks, but also remember that you're a creative. So you may sit down to go and do one thing and say, mm, I actually feel like doing this thing right now. Do the thing that you feel like your brain wants to do. And I know that seems like a weird thing to say, but you're going to not <laughs> spin your wheels as much if you sit down for focused time and then just, you know, focus on the thing you feel like doing. So I usually have an ever-growing list of things that I need to focus on with like mm -hmm. time frames. And I do it in like Google Tasks and Asana and things like that. And then when I sit down, mm -hmm. I might be like, okay, today I need to follow up with these investors, which usually I do, I do, do that right away. <laughs> Number one task. Number one. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes I'll be like, okay, now I need to go and book stuff for a tour. And then I'll say, oh, I kind of feel like doing that tonight maybe right now I want to edit some videos and I'll go into a content hole or something like that. You know, you, mm. it's good to have ways that you work and know your brain and then figure out like how you're going to focus your time. But focused time holes are really important. It's just give yourself a little mm. bit of grace for what you feel like putting in there on a given day. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I thoroughly agree with the time blocking period. Like my calendar is just full of either like meetings or whatever, and then blocked out of time to like, you should be doing this mm -hmm. right now. But a lot of the time you don't end up doing that thing. <laughs> well, and I know myself pretty well now. So sometimes I'll look at my calendar and mine's the same way. It's like different colors for different things. Like, mm. you know, green is my workouts and yellow is my focus time for creative. And like, but sometimes I'll look at my week and say, okay, if I'm coming from there, working out, I'm going to be tired for that amount of time. I'm not going to be able to focus on editing. Maybe I'll give myself like some mindless stuff like following up emails and, you know, that kind of mm. And I'll reshift my stuff around to just understand how I already operate. And then if something needs mm. to get done, I'll be like, I'll put a reminder on there and just, you know, obviously handle it. But, um, you mm. know, I think post pandemic too, I've tried to really find and it's hard when you're busy and have a lot of shit to get done, but, um, try to find a happy medium with like, all right, maybe today you just need to take a half hour and meditate, which I did today. <laughs> so Before the podcast. Yeah, yeah I did. Go, go, I did. Got to meditate for this. <laughs> I was like, I need to cool my brain down. And I, I just did. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And then, um, I swear final few questions. Cause I know I was only going to keep this to 20, 30 minutes, but. Um, how crucial do you think the comedy kind of like audience building was to kind of fueling the fire for all the other stuff that you did? Oh. Do you feel like that was like the main way to build your awareness and your, your audience to kind of like release all these other things to? Yeah. Um, I mean, what do you feel was something else? Yes. So comedy is my number one. Like even if I'm an entrepreneur or whatever other businesses I build, because this will not be the first or the last, um, Comedy is like my favorite thing, but there's a lot of things that branch mm. out from that. You know, there's like pitching series, being in front of the camera, producing and creating content. I mean, these all kind of branch out. The biggest thing that comedy 
taught me is that I'm resilient <laughs> and I'm okay. Mm, it's a great skill set. So number one, when you're on stage, you know, and over time and growing a bunch of material, you learn to pivot on stage really quickly. You know, if something's not, not working, you can call it out. You can make fun of yourself. You can change direction and you can read a room. So those skills have helped with everything. Pitching, public mm -hmm. speaking, um, just being confident with what I have to deliver. Um, it also, I mean, the, you know, years of auditioning and not hearing back from things made me not care about no's. Like, I don't care if somebody doesn't get back to me. Like, I'm not sitting and just waiting. You know, that's the kind of lovely thing about starting as a creative entrepreneur first, because I don't, I'm not like, nobody, <laughs> sounds terrible. <laughs> nobody really matters that much. Like if somebody isn't thinking, if somebody doesn't think that you are important enough to get back to, then that's not your person mm -hmm. to be working with, you know, yeah. surround yourself with people that are like, you're the shit. Oh, you're the shit. I, you know, I think you're the shit. Like, great. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the kind of following yeah. you build too. people that are like excited to see your next move. Like, great. Those are the people you want in your corner, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally <laughs> agree. It's, uh, yeah, you got to surround yourself with people who build you up, not bring you down. Yeah. Um, you don't like what I'm doing. That's fine. Seems simple, but <laughs> hard to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, Natasha, I really appreciate the time. Uh, pleasure talking to you, learning a little bit more about you know, your story and everything that you're doing. Um, where else can we check out what you're up to, uh, follow along on the journey? I know you said you're building a public. So yes, I do it all on my... Where should we head? Um, Instagram is my favorite platform. So I have mm -hmm. like NPH Comedy is my Instagram, Natasha Pearl Hansen. Um, but Neil Patrick Harris pops up first, which is fine. He's like, great. You're I out. would love to work with him one day. NPH squared is my dream. So, um, so you can follow him too. Um, he's also a creative entrepreneur if you don't know who he is. Um, so NPH comedy on every platform and, uh, yeah, I announce everything. I have a new mini special dropping. I'll have another special. I'm going to be shooting soon. I don't have a specific date yet. Um, I, I announce everything there and my website is nphcomedy.com. Awesome. All right. Well, really appreciate uh, everything you've been through today. I think there's been a lot of value that everybody's been able to pull from this. Go out and find your opportunities. Go out and surround yourself with great people. But for today, uh, thanks for listening, guys. And Natasha, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, guys, we put a bunch of effort into making great content for this YouTube channel. So please hit subscribe, uh, leave us a comment, hit like, and tell a few friends about it.